Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Rhode Island has any number of well-known companies. CVS Caremark, Hasbro, until recently, 38 Studios. But some successful companies fly under the radar. Among them, Pickern Military Housing in East Greenwich, which has added nearly 300 jobs nationwide despite the downturn and was just honored by First Lady Michelle Obama for its charitable work on behalf of soldiers and their families. This week on the first half of Executive Suite, Pickern Military Housing CEO John Pickern. Then, Patriots wide receiver Wes Welker has a lot going for him, but his hair was no match for teammate Tom Brady's until his recent visit to Leonard Hair Transplant in Cranston. We get a scouting report on the business of hair restoration with our second guest, Dr. Robert Leonard. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I want to start with an apology to our guest, John Pissern, who's uh, got a hard C on you instead of a soft C in the intro there, and I apologize for That's that. Okay. That's okay. So right. let's, let's kick it off now that we know how to say it properly. What do you do at Pissern Military Housing? Um, well, simply put, we, uh, we develop, build, and manage uh, housing for the United States uh, Army primarily, but the United States uh, military. And uh, what we do is on installations, uh, the Army and the Department of Defense has about 20 to 30 percent of their active duty military members living on installations. Uh, We're talking installations, Fort Bragg, Fort Meade, famous places. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, large, large installations all across the country um, where our fighting men and women serve and train uh, and prepare for, uh, for war. And, um, what, uh, what had happened over the course of, of some years was the, uh, the stress on budget and the stress for uh, where money should be spent. Money was primarily spent on the, uh, what they call guns versus butter. Uh, butter being housing and infrastructure and guns, we all know what those are. So um, they had a really a huge backlog of work that needed to be done, approximately about $30 billion. I'm talking like maintenance on the housing stock? Maintenance, revitalization, modernization. I mean, housing was really in deplorable conditions. For those of us uh, in Rhode Island, if you can think back to uh, around the Quonset uh, Naval Station or down in Newport Naval Station years and years ago, what that looked like, and it was deplorable. So the way our military men and women uh, lived was just not... Uh, not to the standard I think any one of us would want to hold that's where you ourselves to. And that's where we come in. And uh, what they do is they give us a ground lease for 50 years. We actually take over all of their on-post uh, housing stock. Uh, we collect rent individually from the soldiers who want to live there. And uh, we then raise a lot of money and build out uh, new housing and renovate and remodel the old housing. And I think one of the, the biggest keys to our success is not only enhancing the quality of life, but it's a sustainment aspect. So for the next 50 years, the government knows and the Department of Defense knows that the housing will be kept up at a high level versus letting it go down into a, you know, a sad state. And when I was researching this, the scale of it's kind of amazing. It, I read uh, 21,000 homes you're in charge of, 65,000 bedrooms, 10,000 acres of land nationwide. But this wasn't always how, as you sort of alluded to, housing stock was run in the military. Sort of explain how you came in and how the, the privatization, privatization of some of these happened. Well, uh, you know, I, like, as I said a, a minute ago, they, it was a lot of borrow from Peter to pay Paul type of a, of, a, of a system where if an installation had some extra money, they put it into housing to fix it up. Their model, you know, the mindset was, well, people are living there for free, when in reality, they really weren't. Um, and uh, what ended up happening was, like I said, the, the housing really fell into terrible uh, disrepair. Um, we came in and we've spent, as you said, the numbers are, are kind of staggering, but we've spent... Uh, just under $2 billion uh, worth of construction development work, uh, repositioning it. Um, a lot of that money has been spent locally in the markets, and we run from Maryland all the way out to uh, almost the West Coast. Um, and they're, like I said, on installations, about 21,000 homes, about 21,000 families. And those families turn over every year or every couple of years. They move out, and we have to transition and put, put new people back in. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a good business, but even more so, uh, I tell people all the time that for me, after 9-11, uh, this became more of a vocation than a business because, you know, seeing the way our military members live, the amount of deployments, uh, being in Iraq, being in Afghanistan, things like that, and seeing how the stresses that puts on their families 
one of the things I'm really proud is that that uh, we've been told over and over again that we we provide a peace of mind to uh, the soldiers when they're in places like Afghanistan that they're not worrying about what housing looks like. Mm -hmm. Years ago, when a soldier would deploy, like in in um, in uh, Desert Storm uh, back in in '90, when they would deploy, the stories were that they would call back home once a month, once every couple of weeks or so, you know, at best. And they'd listen for 20 minutes about how bad the housing was, and they couldn't get the plumber, they couldn't get an electrician, so forth and so on. And that put tremendous. Imagine being in a, in a battle zone and that stress that puts on you. And now, when they call back, they get to spend 20 minutes talking about kids and homework and what they want to be life. talking you know, about. You yeah. got it about life. Um, you've added about 297 jobs since December 07 nationwide. Uh, 27 here at your headquarters in East Greenwich. Why has Pacern been able to grow when other companies uh, can't? Especially, I was surprised, but considering that we're supposed to be seeing somewhat of a drawdown between Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, well, I think I think there, there's a couple of things that that really play into this. First of all, uh, the military only houses on installations upwards of maybe about 30 percent. So, we'll always have a military. There'll always be a need for housing. We're providing a much better product today than was provided in the past. So. Our demand continues to increase. At a place like Fort Bragg, we have over a thousand people on our wait list uh, every day looking for for housing. So, uh, I think we've been able to withstand kind of the the economic uh, woes. And when I got into the business, I was really looking from a business perspective before it became a vocation before 9/11. I was looking for something that would be recession resistant. I don't think there's such a thing as recession proof. And I found a business aligned with the government that was recession resistant. So. Yeah, we've been able to really withstand and, and actually be able to grow. We're it's quite a contrast with the civilian real estate sector <laughs> since 07. Um, yeah, absolutely. Diametrically opposed uh, to each other. And we actually have, you know, interestingly enough, we had a lot of folks, and it's, it's kind of sad too, but, but we had a lot of military folks who, like others, went out and bought homes on the hopes that the house was going to increase in value over and over again and they have lost their homes. So now they're looking for a place to rent, and these markets aren't necessarily capable of, of providing high-value rentals to, to all these folks. So uh, we see our demand has actually been increasing while the woes of the, uh, of the outside economy has gotten worse. All right, we have to take a break. When we come back, we talk to John Pacern about what's coming next for his company. Stay with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Our guest this week, John Pisern, founder of Pisern Military Housing in East Greenwich and CEO of its new parent company, Corvius Group, which is part of why I wanted to have you on today. Tell me about Corvius Group and the new thing just announced last month with your company. Um, well, we developed uh, Corvius Group, um, and, and Corvius, it's an interesting, it's a kind of made-up word, but it's a combination of two words, via being by way of and core being you know, the core of your heart. We did a market research and people said that our decision making process was really one of kind of a heartfelt process versus a pure economic process so the name seemed to be great and, and that's where we, we've, we've developed to. So Corbius Group uh, really was, uh, was built because we want to expand our business model. Um, the idea of being able to give back and, and do good things for the military seemed to make a lot of sense in looking out, at, out across the horizon to see where else we might be able to do the same thing. And lo and behold, uh, after some research, we found that universities were suffering from a lot of the same challenges that the military did. This idea of constantly dealing with shrinking budgets and where do we put money. And let's face it, you know, the core mission of the military is to fight wars and defend the country. The core mission of schools is to educate students, not necessarily housing. Housing is a byproduct of of developing a school and or developing a military base. So uh, if you go around the country, uh, you'll see quite a few universities that have some new, but mostly old and run down and real challenged uh, uh, housing stock. And it wasn't, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't that long ago that I was in school and I didn't, my dorms weren't always in the best shape. Yeah, I was, I was mentioning to you earlier that there was this, uh, a, a friend of mine told me a story when we did this that uh, he said, you know, I dropped, he dropped his son off at, at uh, a large university last year and he said his son went into the same dorm that he had lived in some 25 years ago. I believe it. And the dorm looked the same 25 <laughs> years later. So I think that's a pretty common story. Uh, so what we're trying to do under Corvius Group and Corvius Campus Living really is to provide that same level of caring and partnership with schools where we can take over their entire housing stock and working with them 
develop a new program and a new platform for housing for the next 25, 30, or 40 years. Uh, my years. question right away would be um, why, you know, we're talking about the financial pressures on schools, public schools, as well as not for profit private schools. Where is the money going to come from to hire you as opposed to, you know, keep doing what they're doing or not spend much money on it at all, maybe? So uh, what, what has to happen is a school, first of all, has to have a desire to create a better living environment, which I think they all do. Then they have to be willing to work with us where we will actually, uh, we've come up with a system, which is kind of our secret sauce, so to speak, where we've come up with a, uh, a financial system where we can take the housing off of their current balance sheet and take the students and have them rent from us, the same housing, but have them rent from us directly and we can then capitalize that into a larger amount of, of debt dollars to go out and reconstruct and rebuild. Understanding that we're in the business of doing this each and every day, we have economies of scale, we have ways of buying, our buying power is different, our maintenance structure is different. We, you know, we do housing every day, we don't educate students every day, so we probably can uh, perform at a, a large percentage cheaper than they can. Do you have any contracts yet? Uh, we do not. We have uh, conversations right now. We have two really good conversations going on locally, and uh, hopefully within the next month or so we'll be able to announce some, some new new programs. You're also the owner of 1149 Restaurant in Seacock. I am the owner of 1149 Restaurant in Seacock and 1149 in Warwick. Oh, right. The other yeah, one. Yeah, there was another two, one, too. Two so, uh, yeah, serial entrepreneur. Scratching an itch, I think that was uh, <laughs> that's called. Um, yeah, the restaurant's actually doing quite well, and... Uh, you know, again, I think I think Rhode Island's a great place to you, a great place to do business, uh, but it does take it takes a lot of uh, of energy and effort, uh, I think, to get. Good How do output. you mean? Expand on that. Uh, I think you know it's we were we were mentioning earlier about not uh, being too avid, one of the one of the kind of lesser known companies, and there's a reason for that. Uh, part of it is. Um, I wish I could say that Rhode Islanders supported local businesses better, uh, but we we seem to not be real happy about others ex, uh, others' success. And, Do you mean uh, that as individuals or as a as in terms of the government? I think we've I think we have grown, uh, and I've been a resident you know pretty much my whole life, and I think we've grown to believe that anybody who is successful has to have an inside track or an inside deal. You hear that and a lot, just, and it just isn't true. Uh, I think I think success can come, and it's a small place, and it's not an easy place to do business. You, know, you, you, we all know that. It's the economy's hard. It's, a, it's, you know, it's a tough place. There's a lot of land. There's a lot of real estate. A lot of, a lot of, of population growth. So, uh, all the things against a lot of headwinds, as they would say, against you. And then the other challenge is that I don't think there's a lot of of great support for local businesses doing well because everybody is looking around for the conspiracy, looking around for. How did that happen? How did somebody get there? And I think it's unfortunate. Uh, I think we could really do a much better job of helping to support each other and support our Concretely, local what's something if the governor came to you, if the EDC, whoever ends up running it, came to you and asked what, you know, what could be done to support companies? You know, your company is always going to have a big footprint elsewhere by nature of your business. But what, what comes to mind? What makes it difficult? Um, I think you know, I, I think we could discuss uh, things around labor practices. I think we could discuss things around around some of the union challenges and, and the sizes of the unions. Uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't have unions. I think we should discuss though some moderate positions. I think I think I would like to see us have an open dialogue around a moderate platform of business growth and business management. And I think, you know, we, we talked about, not to, to get too political, but you mentioned earlier about, you know, jokingly about 38 studios, you know, and, and everybody can see that now in, in retrospect or in hindsight that one big investment doesn't make a lot of sense. I think a lot of small investments and widespread investments and in support makes more sense. So I think a moderate platform and a moderate moving forward and dialogue around that uh, would make would make more sense. We only have about a minute left, but I want to turn back to your company for a second. Actually, it's Charitable Arm, which was honored, I mentioned at the top, by uh, Michelle Obama mm -hmm. and Jill Biden. Uh, it's called Our Family for Families First Foundation. What does it do and what was the award? So uh, probably the proudest moment of my uh, of my career uh, came this year. We were honored by uh, the first and second lady uh, in their challenge of um, giving back to the military. And our foundation, I started a foundation back in 2006 giving scholarships to, um, to college-bound um, military kids, military students. And uh, we've given out a little over three and a half million dollars towards them, plus another about a million dollars towards uh, grants to spouses. 
Bottom line is the government doesn't have money, enough money to give out GI bills to everybody across the, you know, across the, the military, so the kids kind of suffer. And for all they've gone through with dads being deployed and stuff, we thought this was a great way to give back. So. Uh, we're just trying to help, and you got, and you were honored for it. Uh, we, this we year. Were, it was it was it was great. Going to the White House was a uh, was a very special, very very special moment. I can imagine. All right, we have to go to a break. Thank you, uh, John, for being with us. Up next, we'll talk to the man who gave Wes Welker a new do. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I want to welcome our second guest, Dr. Robert Leonard of Leonard Hair Transplant Associates, who got my attention with a press release showing Wes Welker with you, our, our, one of our favorite Patriots players. Uh, he's become one of your hair transplant patients. How did that happen? Well, uh, Wes, like many men, was concerned about his hair loss, and he sought me out for a consultation. I offer free consultations at my seven offices in New England, and we did a consultation. I determined that he was a candidate expectations were realistic which is very important with patients and we decided to schedule a procedure which happened uh, the third of July about so a month ago pretty recently yeah. so in time to get ready for uh, for the season can he wear his helmet normally and he can that was a concern because obviously when we do the surgery uh, it's of the head and the helmets can be rather snug so sure. I wanted to make sure there was enough time in between for him to be able to be comfortable because the last thing we want to do is affect his game in a negative no, way because if he, if he drops a catch again we're gonna blame you now and that's a lot <laughs> add that so, to the list well, right so walk me through what uh, how does a hair trans how did his hair transplant procedure work what did well, you do well I have an office in Cranston right on Reservoir Avenue and we have a patient come in on surgery day we utilize local anesthetics so they don't have any uh, anesthesia with they're knocked out at all Patients choose a movie and during the procedure. So what I do, I remove skin and hair from the back of the head, which genetically grows lifelong, and then we transplant it to the top. And the technique is one where I actually numb everything up in the back and remove a small strip of uh, skin that have the follicles in it. They're dissected under magnification, and then the top is numbed after I design a hairline with the patient, and I make little incisions in that area, and the transplants take place. And we shampoo the patient's hair, put on a baseball cap and home they go. So they don't need anybody to drive them, they can drive themselves, they're wide awake during the procedure. So what, in the end, does your hair, does that hair grow like if, as if it had always been there in the end? It does, so what happens is because this hair grows lifelong, where I move it to, it will grow lifelong. So when the transplants occur, they're very, very small pieces that have one, two, and three hairs, they're tiny. And they're planted and they're short when they're planted, they're shaven low. And then those original hairs, after two or three weeks, grow and fall out, which is physiologic. I get phone calls saying, oh my god, my hair's falling out, but that's supposed to happen. But three or four months then go by, and that's when the new hairs develop. And those hairs grow about one quarter inch per month, which is normal hair growth rate. So around six months after the transplant is when someone can really see a cosmetic change but 12 to 18 months after the procedures when everything's fully grown in. So you're basically giving someone a head of hair that they wouldn't have been able to have before because they would have been balding like, like so many of our fathers did before us. That's <laughs> exactly right. So what we're doing is actually in areas that are thin or bald, we're replenishing the hair that they lost due to male or female pattern hair loss. So the beauty of transplantation, they can cut and comb and color and curl. It's their own growing hair forever. It's normal hair. It's just now it's been, it's been moved, but it's then it's just like you can treat it like the hair. It's, it's your own hair already. from the back that we moved up front. So so um, you've been all over the place. I saw and you went to Rome to talk about it. You were in Greece talking about this process. So you're an expert on it. I got to ask, how dangerous is it? Can there be complications? It, it's a local anesthetic surgery of the skin, so there is very little danger. The only thing I truly worry about is if a person has an allergic reaction to some medicine like mm -hmm. uh, Novocaine or something like that. And by a per, by the time a person, I see the person by tw in the 20s and older they know if they're allergic to anything. So otherwise, it's an extraordinarily safe procedure. It really is. You've been in the business for a while now. How long have you been doing that? 26 hair years. 26 years. Yeah. So uh, tell me about growth. Has there been increasing demand over the years? Has the technology has changed? What have you seen? Well, the technology has changed dramatically, thank goodness, because the old days, the, the transplants didn't look all that natural. They were called the old plugs. And that's something that was done back in the 70s and 80s. 1991 was the last time I did that type of old transplant. And during the decade of the 90s, what happened, just like with computers, we miniaturized. So it went from big graphs to tiny graphs. And today, uh, transplants are undetectable, and if a person did one session, it's standalone. They don't have to do multiple sessions unless they want to either make it more thick someday, have a thicker head of hair, or as they lose non-transplanted hair, 
to replenish those as time goes by. Now, Wes is going to be doing advertisements for your company. I'm curious, from a business perspective, regardless of what business you're in, how did you decide that um, that a celebrity endorsement was something that could help you? you know, how did you decide? Well, it's very important because most men are extraordinarily private about the hair loss, extremely so. And what I thought with, especially someone who uh, like Wes, who is a really wonderful human being, and plus a very well-known person in this region, that he can sort of take it out of the closet, help us to continue to take it out of the closet, and so people can be not embarrassed about coming in for hair restoration. It's natural, it's their own growing hair. It's not like we're putting some artificial thing in a patient's head. It's their own growing hair, and, and someone like Wes who can go through it himself, choose me, which is wonderful as well, and uh, talk about it is, is, is exciting, but it's also, it's helpful because we can help it raise awareness of hair loss in the proper medical and surgical therapies available to treat it. Now, I can imagine people sitting at home saying, oh, wait a sec, maybe this is something I'd be eligible for. You mentioned before, you looked at Wes Welker, you said, okay, yes, he's eligible. How do you determine if someone can get this procedure? Well, number one is expectations. They have to have realistic expectations with any cosmetic procedure. But it depends how bald someone is. If someone, ha we we're actually have a supply and a demand. So if the supply can meet the demand, the patient's a candidate. Um, I, I really talk about expectations a great deal during the consultation and we go through the procedure and, and they have to wait. The hardest part of the procedure really is not surgery day, it's waiting for the hairs to grow because humans want everything done yesterday. And it takes months, it's not like days or weeks, it takes months to see a change. But when they come in for their six month visit and they see hair that they didn't have and we show the before pictures, it's very exciting. It's very exciting now, for them and for me. Now, this is a medical procedure, but I, it's all, I don't know, do any insurers cover it? Is it primarily people have to pay for it themselves? Right, it's, it's a cosmetic procedure. So it's very rare that we have anybody uh, have it paid by insurance. I do some cases where people have had brain cancer and radiation therapy. And under those very unusual and often tragic circumstances, insurance will pay and I'll fight hard for those patients. But typically, the average patient comes in because they want to look better, but more importantly, feel better. People liked it when they had hair. And as they lose it, sometimes they lose a little bit of their mojo, frankly. And we can get it back for them slowly but surely. How expensive do the procedures run? Transplants run anywhere from $4,500 to $15,000, depending upon the technique as well as depending upon the size of the area that we actually transplant. Smaller areas, smaller fee and larger areas, larger. Fit. And have you gotten a lot of feedback since the photo went out with Welker? Oh and my now God, it's been, it's been a, a roller coaster. <laughs> we had a great day a couple of Mondays ago when we did the press release, uh, multiple TV stations and blogs all over the world. I was on TMZ. It was kind of <laughs> funny, TMZ. really. Oh, it was funny. <laughs> and uh, so we had a great, it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. And I enjoy this sort of aspect of my life as well. I'm very, very blessed to be able to be where, I, where I'm in my career, but also to these sort of things, which I think are, are really cool. Cool. Well, uh, well, we'll be looking for Wes's hair under the helmet there as the season gets off to a start. You can watch preseason games here on MyRI TV. My boss would want me to tell you that. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for this week. I want to thank both our guests, Dr. Robert Leonard and John Pisern of Pisern Military Housing. And I want to thank you for tuning in here on MyRI TV. If you missed any of it, catch it on our website. See you next week on Executive Suite.